Padilla, just so people understand how big your portfolio is, I'm going to try to name everything. You're going to have oh. to jump in here. Yeah, uh, Pop quiz. Combs Enterprises, <laughs> Sean John, Bad Boy Entertainment, Revolt TV, Revolt Media, Blue Fame Flame Marketing Agency, Ciroc Vodka, De Leon Tequila, Janice Combs Publishing, Combs Foundation. Yes, except we just launched a new brandy. A new brand, okay. <laughs> a new brandy, okay. We can't stop, won't stop, so something new happens every day. Um, yes, that is everything. So that's all in your portfolio. Yes. What was your first real job? Uh, so out of college, my first job out of college was with the Department of Defense. Um, long story short, some of you guys remember there was lots of scandals, $700 hammers, lots of proposals, what appeared to be overspending in DOD, and the Department of Defense said, we're going to go out, we're going to find talented young people all around the country and change the procurement process, and I was fortunate to be part of that program. So you started the Department of Defense. Yes. You also worked in pharmaceuticals. You worked in yes. club promotion. So many jobs. So many jobs. Yes. What are they I'm all? I'm 78. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do they have in common for you? Hmm. Well, for me, I learned very early on. Actually, I used to work at a, a nightclub doing promotions in my 20s. And the guy who owned it, I learned two things. One was I was surprised financially that this small but successful club, I started just doing the math in my head. And I was like, hey, this guy's making millions of dollars a year. I didn't even know this was an option at a small, tiny nightclub in Washington, D.C. The second thing I learned, uh, the more important thing was everywhere we would go, he would look around at the level of talent no matter where we were. So we would be at Houston's and it could be like, I just noticed that waitress over there is memorizing everybody's, bringing extra napkins. She didn't forget the line for the ginger ale. That's the kind of person we need on our team. Mm -hmm. And he would literally go over, talk to her, and figure out how to bring her in and train her about how to run a bar. We'd be at Home Depot getting stuff for a big promotion. Same thing, like, that guy really went above and beyond. And it occurred to me, and I learned very early on that, and someone just said this, right? Like, talent's available everywhere. Beyond, the technical aptitude can be taught, but, like, make sure when you think about what recruitment means, you're just not recruiting in the same small pool. So when you got the call to come take the interview with yes. Combs Entertainment, yes. had you been looking there? Had you been thinking about it? Not at all. I was not looking whatsoever. Um, I was in advertising sales for Clear Channel, um, and I had the music industry as a category. Um, I had been able to break Bad Boy Records, if you're familiar, as a client with this radio station. I'm in New York, so you may know Power 105 at the time, 2000. Five. Um, and literally one of, one of Sean's executives called me and was like, Sean's looking to hire chief of staff. I just, you send emails out at 3 a.m. I think you guys might get along. Like, no <laughs> real, like, honestly, that was basically, I was like, okay. Like, so uh, I was like, I'll take the interview. I've always been very open to like, I'll take the interview. Like, I always want to just see what opportunities exist. Um, super short interview, like four and a half minutes. He asked great questions. He has like the best poker face. Um, I walked out, I was like, I have no idea. Uh, they called me and said, Sean really wants to bring you on, but you've not managed really large teams before. Would you be willing to come on as an executive assistant versus uh, the chief of staff role. That's a big span from executive assistant to chief of staff, but you didn't let that stop me. I didn't though. let it stop me. I said, look, you get, this is what I want to make. You can call me the janitor, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started. And uh, October 5th, 2005, we joke it's a bit like dog years there, so I've been there for a long time now, but um, was uh, started and then was able to be promoted, 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 and now I'm the president of Combs Enterprises. Why didn't you let the, uh, yeah, that deserves applause, I think, right? <laughs> A lot of people do get hung up on titles. What was it that made you say, you know, especially a lot of, I think people get afraid to get stuck in the assistant role, especially yes. women and people of color. One, why, why didn't that, why wasn't that a deterrent to you? And then two, what did you do to make sure you didn't get stuck in the assistant, in people's minds? I love to learn, so I'm much more concerned about am I in a place that I can learn versus whatever I'm called. Um, and if I feel like I'm not, I know it sounds a little bit corny, but I mean that very sincerely in a way that goes back to like life is very, very short. And as much time as we spend at work, I just, I don't want to be bored. I want to be able to be stimulated. So for me, it mattered very little what I was called. But I was like, this guy, I think I can learn from this guy. And, and that's why I want to be there. And in terms of moving from there, um, you know, I'm, I try to manage every relationship in my life, no matter whether it's with work or with you or whatever it is, with a lot of, in, with a lot of intention. Because otherwise, again, going back to my almost like religious appreciation for time, um, like if you don't, it will just be gone. Right? Mm -hmm. So I am from day one, like, OK, in 90 days, I want XXXX. Let me immediately show what value I'm bringing to the table, why it makes sense for everybody in this relationship, and let's go to the next level. Otherwise, it's not good for either of us. You also know your value. 
you, how did you learn that? A lot of people, there's a lot of women have a hard time knowing their value. The truth is, I think a lot of women know their value. I don't know that um, they're, sh they're showing it as loudly as they should be, right? right? So I think the critical piece is, and I've seen this personally on the other side, when I'm, um, when I'm doing my employee reviews, I find disproportionately, you know, the young, you know, men, my, the, the male employees are very happy to say I deserve a raise without honestly sometimes less support Then I'll see women who actually deserve a raise and I'll have to say, hey, do you want to advocate for yourself here in this conversation? <laughs> um, so um, to, to the, I, and I have a quick example of this. Um, many, many years ago, we were hiring a, when I used to be Sean's chief of staff, we were hiring a, a chef for him. He loved this woman's cooking, but she was a junior chef. She had not been in this capacity before. And um, I said, we'd like to offer you the job. What would you like? And what she, she was coming from Seattle, and what she proposed was preposterous. So I literally said to her, I was like, I don't, I'm not accepting that. Didn't know her, except for an interview. I'm not accepting that. Go on payscale.com. Go on Sherm. Go Google New York. Go mm -hmm. look at New York City rates. I will be here. Call me back at the end of the day, and then tell me what you're asking for. Like, you need to advocate for yourself. Um, and I think we have to be, it's incumbent upon us, no matter what side of the table you're on, um, to help teach and, and, and actually show in real life how to advocate for yourself. You, you came up through some more traditional kind of businesses than the entertainment business. Yeah. Um, we had a conversation earlier about being your authentic self. Did you find a change when you went to the entertainment business? Because it can be a, a little looser, it can be a little more accepting than someplace like the Department of Defense or a hardcore pharmaceutical company. It was dramatically different um, working for a minority-owned company, for one, um, and in a way that has been extremely empowering for anything that I've done since. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I worked at Department of Defense, or for GlaxoSmithKline, I was super hyper-conscious as a black woman about what I would share, um, the things people ask about your weekends, and I've always felt the burden of whatever information I share, whatever success, really will represent an entire population. So I took it very seriously and was friendly, but polite, but politely friendly, never mm -hmm. overshared, and was never, um, I don't know, just unabashedly me. Um, one of the greatest experiences I think about working for Sean is he is just unabashed about like, Diversity matters. Like it's important. It's important. For, it's important because it's the right thing to do. As we all know, the business case shows that it's just good for business in real life. Um, and it has been awesome and freeing to be in a place where you can be unabashedly you every day. And I encourage that of everybody on our team. And I encourage that in our partners that we work with. When was a time in your career when you knew that either your your gender or your race was on somebody else's mind in the room? Oh, like every day, every, every single day. Um, there's no, nothing has dramatically changed, right? For all the wonderful conversation from 2018 to 2017, the amount of women CEOs has gone down, right? So still every room I go to in every industry, in spirits, in fashion, in fragrance, in music, um, in television, if I'm at a senior level, a board level, a hundred million dollar conversation level room, I am for sure the only woman. And the only reason why I'm not the only minority is because Sean's in the room. Mm -hmm. Still, last week. Like, that's, that's, not, that's not new. Like, you know? I saw it flash behind your eyes. Yeah, like <laughs> something very specific right now. Yeah. Um, you, interestingly, you, you once said in an interview that you want the, the idea of work-life balance to be deleted from the conversation. Like, we just need to get rid of it. Uh, why do you think? Why do you think that? Well, I think it's just a setup for failure. It's not achievable. It's a Disney not like it's just not real. Oh, I'm. Yes. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. Oh, we're going old school. Okay. How about now? Well, we're both a little bit loud. Oh, there we go. Can you can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I, I think the idea of work life balance is enormously ridiculous. So I have um, I have wonderful parents. My mother has multiple sclerosis, and she has it's hard for her to walk. She's in a wheelchair, so I have a lot of we all dealing with something in one capacity. I have a five year old, a wonderful husband that does still require some maintenance. I have it. <laughs> I, we, we're over, you know, I don't know, seventeen different portfolios of brands. Uh, Sean Combs, if you're familiar with him, is is quite an intense yet wonderful visionary of a boss to work for. Um, so if I were to pretend that on every given day I've made my organic cookies for the PTA and I've done all my employee reviews wonderfully and I plan date night. It's it's a ludicrous proposition. What I try to do, and I, and I say this quite a bit, is I just think about it, um, instead of thinking about juggling balls in the air, right, which is what clowns do, is what I often say. Like, I don't want to be in the circus, although it feels like I'm in the circus some days. I want to be in a batting cage, right? I just want to hit whatever I'm in front of, like, out the park. So I, wanna, I try to be, if I'm with my daughter, I'm going to put the phone down and be in that moment. If I'm in a boardroom, I'm going to be in that moment. But to try to do all of these things in concert, it's just a recipe for failure. 
What, you mentioned that because it, it's different in a, a minority-owned company, and if you go to the C-suite on your on the Combs Enterprises, it's all people of color and women. Yes, full stop. Uh, what about companies that are legacy companies? I mean, it's still a fairly new company in, in the pantheon of companies, sure. right? But these companies have been around for a really long time where there are certain behaviors and cultures baked in. What are a couple of things that people who work for these companies could do to sort of start to nudge them forward? I think we gotta be okay with being like frank and more forgiving, right? So I think, uh, I, I do this a bit, I'm, I work with, um, you know, traditional, it's a traditional white man who's, run, who's a CEO who has the, whether he has the best of intentions or no intentions, we gotta be okay with saying like, hey, let me help you. I'm walking around your offices and I don't see it. Let me help you out here. And, I've, and I'm able to have those conversations where they'll also say to me like, we, like between me and you, we can't find anybody like you. Now, we can argue whether or not that's accurate or not, but I'd rather just say, let me, let me show you the way. I'll show you the way. Like, here, let's be able to have an honest conversation with different, um, you know, with different ethnicity or sexual preference and all the many differences that make us so awesome. Um, but it's not going to work in these continued silos or this level of um, constant, you know, we, we're kind of in a situation where we're just blaming each other all the time. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's, it's not working. It's not mm -hmm. working in real life. Um, so these companies that have been what they feel like is working well, right? They're like, I've, I've been around for 150 years. We make a lot of money. We're a multi-billion dollar company. Diversity feels, whether they will acknowledge it, can feel like a burden, can feel like somebody coming into your home, changing the furniture, getting the orange juice brand you don't like, right? And I think it's important for us to be able to show like, no, it's, it's, it's actually fun. Like you like, you, you like to understand about different cultures. You travel all around the world, right? I know I've seen you in other neighborhoods at our, the restaurants, right? Like, so take it to the next level where it's not just a fun, frivolous thing to do to culture jump. Get deep and understand it and see how it actually, for real, makes us better, both for our pockets and for our hearts and for our total enrichment of life. I'm going to take a couple of questions after this one. Um, I interviewed Emily. Can you hear me? I interviewed Emily Chang, who wrote a book called Brotopia about Silicon Valley. And one of the things you hear a lot from Silicon Valley folks about why it's predominantly white and male is there's no pipeline, the pipeline issue. Um, a lot of people think that's a lot of BS. What do you think about the pipeline issue if you, you may think it's true? What can we do to change it if you think it's true? Or is that an excuse? I think it's both. I think that the reality of unconscious bias, particularly in America, and the situation of the racial divide in America is a real thing from when a baby's in somebody's belly. Like, let's just talk about that, right? So there are, there are gaps. There's, there's a reality around like, yes, you can go into different neighborhoods. Are there things that certain two and three year olds in different ethnicities are not being exposed to? And trying to catch up at 23 years old, applying for Silicon Valley may put you at a disadvantage. Nonetheless, I do feel like there's a lot more opportunity in people who are available and trained and brilliant and brilliant. We know this all probably from the, when you do blind interviews, right? You'll find that it, uh, I've seen it go up to as much as um, uh, you get diverse candidates going from, I think it's 14% to 60% when you blindly look at them without seeing their names or their faces, right? So you know, we all know, and I'm sure this has been talked about quite a bit today, the level of unconscious bias in, in what you think is a lack of pipeline, it's absolutely fueling that. Now, does that get you double? And now there are some, still, some, some real pipeline issues? Yeah, but we need to address first, let us deal with who's available, because there are people available. Let's take a couple calls, our last calls. I've been on the radio. On the hotline. <laughs> oh, all right. Tell me on my scene, okay. <laughs> you know what I do every day from 12 to 2. <laughs> in the back there. My name is Marak. I am the head of talent acquisition at Hinge. Um, I just had a really quick question. Um, it's around executive presence and how you can either develop that or coach um, more junior level employees on having an executive presence, especially when having conversations with C-levels or higher ups within the organization. The two things um, to me that are most important is a level of confidence and a commitment to excellence. Um, as an example, when I worked for Department of Defense, I started, I was 21 years old. I was given a $150 million contract to negotiate. I had very limited experience in it, and my boss was gone most of the time. Um, I was negotiating with people who had literally been in the industry for over 50 years. And they were like, why is she in the room? Get me some coffee. Like, why are you here? Um, and um, so, of course, that's scary. It's scary, right? Um, so for me, I just, and I'm not suggesting like, oh, just 
pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But it was important to like, I had to go around the clock and learn the federal acquisition regulations. It's hard, it's a lot of information. Um, so I think when we talk about, um, when we talk about helping like our junior teammates, one of it comes down to like, it's going to be harder for you. And everybody has to be okay with that. Like when you're junior, it's gonna be harder for you. It's not going to be fair. It's not gonna be fair. So you do need to figure out how you can be committed to it, but then also be confident in what you bring to the table. You have a level of understanding of culture, likely a level of understanding at least of some portion of the demographics of your organization that you bring to the table. So you should be comfortable to come with the level of gravitas when you enter a room and share what your unique lens brings to the table. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Uh, my name is Brooke. I work in recruiting and fintech. Um, I wanted to know if you had some tips on how you balance hitting diversity metrics and then the risk of having a perception of tokenism. So um, we're quite intentional about um, managing diversity, specifically at Combs Enterprises. It's a personal mission for us, not just in the internal hires, but in the external, the way, we, the way our brands show up from a content or media standpoint. And it's not, again, you have to be okay with, it's not gonna be easy to do. So when I think back to starting in 2005, every time we would shoot a commercial, we would go to agencies and say, we got all the model books, but we also need to see more brown women. We don't care, just wanna see a diversity of color. And it would sometimes literally take 10, 12, 15 agencies to be able to get three to 10 options. Or we would call around and say, do you, does anybody know? And just send us some like, we just need some like, great women of color because we're sitting in front of stacks of books that don't have it. Now, another organization may just be like, we really tried. We, we suggested we wanted it. We got two books. They weren't in there. That's it. You have to actually be so committed to it to go the extra mile and make the extra call and say, we will not shoot this video. You will not get hired if we don't have this. Um, internally, um, I know quotas are somewhat controversial, but I think math matters. Um, and the reality is if something is not measured, it often just doesn't happen. Um, so if you don't have real math goals to diversity and then you don't have actual consequences for not hitting them, I just, I, in my experience that the organization tends to flounder in showing true diversity. I'm gonna get the last question in. There's been a lot of discussion and you hear it a lot lately about people saying, failures are great and we should embrace failure and it's a way to move forward. Do you think women and people of color have the, are, are allowed to fail? I mean, it's one of those things, or is that just for the certain privileged folks? Yeah, listen, fail forward, it sounds lovely. I love alliteration, but I think <laughs> that, <laughs> I think that the reality is that no, I don't, I think that any, and let's be clear, it's broader than women of color. I think when you have, when you are anything different than what is the status quo in your organization, you don't usually have the flexibility and the freedom to fail maybe once, um, but as I said in the beginning, not only will you have a disproportionate waiting for that failure, you will likely impact the future next to you, mm -hmm. which is a lot of burden, um, but it is a reality of where we exist and it doesn't change unless we are also in leadership and we are also in boards, which I don't think changes unless there's like real quotas and consequences. Would you share something where you were near fail that you think you really did get some benefit from, something that in your career? Hmm. We have a think. Um, real neo failure. I would say um, this is not. This is this is a terrible story. But when I when I was in, I want to say like when I was Sean's chief of staff. It's like a bad example, but it's interesting. We um, Sean at the time had multiple dogs. <laughs> And there was like a bad transition between one assistant to the other assistant, and we like lost a dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! For a while, we found the dog eventually, and um, <laughs> and it was really traumatic. So of no. course, we've all made mistakes, whatever it was. But like as a human being, I was like, I'm my desk, like this is like the worst thing I've ever <laughs> done in my life. How do you tell a person you lost their dog? Like, I was like, this is horrible. Um, and luckily, Sean's sister actually came. I think she was more familiar with the dog's habits and found it in the sixth floor, like behind the thing in the closet. But it was like <laughs> five hours of like sheer, like me just feeling like, what, if, what kind of human being loses someone's dog? Right? Okay. And um, the, thing that, the thing that it did underscore to me, and I, I kind of have used it since though, is it's just kind of like how much everything matters. And it's a little off topic, but like how much the details, like I might've been working on some big deal and not paying attention to the dog, but the dog really matters. Okay. <laughs> so so it, did, it did make it, no, it seems like a point. small thing, but it, 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 it drove home to me how much every single portion of the day, whether it's making sure the personal assistant has the right ties lined up so that he doesn't wear the wrong tie on, that the tie business tanks and 200 employees at Macy's lose their job, right? Like every little thing matters and I needed to take it seriously and make sure that our team took it seriously, so. We call it my business, everything's a thing. Everything's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let you go that way. The thing you're most proud of. 
Oh, golly. Um, professionally. Oh, professionally, yes, because of course it's my daughter. Right. Um, I don't know if, whether or not you indulge in spirits. Sorak Vaca <laughs> was, was my first baby mm -hmm. um, from the beginning to now, and from a brand that was failing with the number one company in the world, Yajou in Spirits, to now over 16 million cases sold around the world. That when I travel around and I see it there, and I'm like, I made that flavor peach, um, uh. continues <laughs> to make me feel really proud, and more importantly, it, it, this is another industry spirits that you may not think about is hardly any representation, particularly at that time. Um, and since then, there has been hundreds and hundreds of new music relationships and, and much more diversity and much more attention and investment and jobs in diverse communities, which we feel like we were a part of changing. So we're, I know I'm incredibly proud and Sean's incredibly proud of that. Dia, thank you for making time for us today, thank considering you. your schedule. We really appreciate <laughs> it.